evening, council met early this evening and closed to discuss potential leases of land, a legal opinion regarding a settlement offer and a confidential verbal update regard regarding a governance matter and staff were provided with direction. We will now rise from closed session. Councillor Earnshaw, you have the motion. Could you please read it? Thank you, Mayor Liggett. It's moved by me and seconded by Councillor Ermetta that council rise from closed session and reconvene in open session at 6.49 p.m. Thank you, I'll ask the clerk to call for the vote. Starting voting. And closing voting. And that carries unanimously. Please note that the City of Cambridge Council meetings are broadcast on the City's YouTube page and archived on the City's website. It is imperative that we as City Council promote public participation using a variety of methods, including YouTube. On that note, our last Council meeting had 199 views on YouTube, and I would like to point out that we also have rules of engagement during Council meetings. I ask that you be respectful while others are speaking, refrain from any demonstrations, and I encourage you to actively listen to others. For staff and delegates alike, please be sure that you stand six to eight inches from the microphone at the presenter's podium for optimal sound quality. In the event of an emergency, please evacuate council chambers using the nearest exit staircase. If you require assistance, please see our clerk staff and they will provide you with support to exit the facility. Once you have evacuated the building, please gather outside of City Hall in the Farmer's Market parking lot and await further instructions. Now I'd like to introduce council. Councillor Kimson, Councillor Devine sends his regrets, Councillor Earnshaw, Councillor Roberts, Councillor Hamilton, Councillor Cooper, and Councillor Ameta. And a special thanks to our clerks and technology services staff who are assisting with logistics for this evening. We will now sing the uh, national anthem. If you are able, please rise and follow along. We embrace our shared responsibility with the Indigenous peoples to take care of this earth and its creatures. We can only do so by walking the path as partners stewarding this land, as we have been given the duty together to live in balance and harmony with all living things. We acknowledge and respect the Indigenous peoples who came before us and who we live amongst. By honouring this truth of past and present, may we come to true reconciliation through listening, reflecting and learning. A reminder to members of council that the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act requires council members to declare any direct or indirect pecuniary, 
pecuniary interest in relation to a matter under consideration. Are there any declarations this evening? Seeing none. Uh, before we continue with our regular agenda, we have Katie Watson from the Rotary Club of Cambridge, Preston Hessler, with us to speak on the Ro Rotary Club's request to install a police uh, peace poll, not a police poll. <laughs> Welcome, Katie. Thank you. Uh, I am Katie from the Rotary Club of Cambridge, Preston Hessler. We like to install a peace poll. Peace polls are an iconic symbol of May Peace Prevail on Earth International, founded in J Japan over 50 years ago. There's estimated 250,000 polls, peace polls around the world, and we would like to put Cambridge on the map. The peace poll is five feet by four inches by four inches deep, and to install the pole, we need to dig one foot deep hole, fill with cement, and place a pole in the cement. We would like to install the peace pole at the end of Ham Hamlet Street, Hamlet Street in Hessler, right after the Our Lady of Fatima School. There's a pathway there with a bench, with a rotary uh, bench that we would like to install the pole, pole there. Thank you. Does council have any comments or questions from this? Okay. Um, just waiting for the correct motion here. It's not this one. Oh, okay. <laughs> So, Councillor Earnshaw, you have the motion. Could you please put it on the floor? The motion, thank you, Mayor Liggett, but I require a seconder. Councillor Kimson will second the motion. So it's moved by me and seconded by Councillor Kimson that council supports the Rotary Club of Cambridge's request to erect a peace poll on city property by the Rotary Club of Cambridge's bench on the pathway at the end of Hammett Street past Our Lady of Fatima Catholic Elementary School in coordination with operations staff and the staff be directed to enter into a maintenance agreement with the Rotary Club. Thank you, Councilor Earnshaw. Uh, do we have any questions or comments from Council? None, okay. I'll ask clerk to call for the vote. Starting voting. And closing voting. And that carries unanimously. So our first item for consideration is the consent agenda. Councillor uh, Hamilton, you have that motion. Could you please read it? Thank you, Mayor Liggett. It's moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Earnshaw. The recommendation that all items listed under the heading of consent agenda for September 12th, 2023 be adopted as recommended. 8.1, special council meeting minutes, August 17th, 2023. 8.2, council workshop minutes, August 17th, 2023. 8.3, council meeting minutes, August 29th, 2023. 8.4, council information package, September 1st, 2023. 8.5, 23-297-CD, exemption from part lot control, Lidstone Street and Gledhill Crescent. Thank you, I will ask the uh, clerk to call for the vote now. Starting voting. And closing voting. And that carries unanimously. We will now move into consideration of reports and our first agenda item is report 23-041-CRE 2024 to 2026 strategic plan key components. And we have a pre presentation from Jenna brown Jowd, our director of corporate strategy. Welcome, Jenna. Good 
Good evening, Mayor, Council, members of the community and staff. I'm Again, I'm Jenna Branjawa, Director of Corporate Strategy. I'm pleased to be here tonight to present an update on the development of the 24 to 26 strategic plan and also to ask for Council's endorsement on the key components of the plan. Next slide, please. So we wanna start with providing you an update on the progress of the development of the plan. So as you can see from the roadmap in front of you, uh, we have provided a timeline for the development of the plan. So the plan development is considered over the course of the year. You'll see key phases as well as key milestones on the roadmap. Everything on the left-hand side in gold uh, text are items that we've completed to date. So some of those major items that we have completed at this time include uh, looking at the progress of our current plan and the, the status of how far we've gotten and what we have left to achieve. You'll see um, that we've updated the scope of the plan and we've had conversations around what that update entails. We've done some work around a longer range business plan, which of course is the action of our strategic plan and how we're going to achieve it. And we've also had some conversations with council through workshops as well as focus groups to look at the key components of that plan. At this time, we've also done some work under phase two, number five, engaging staff in how we will educate and launch the plan and developing some tools and templates. Um, and we do have some work left to do. As you can see from the roadmap, we are on track to deliver um, and come to council to receive approval in January of 2024 with our launch implementation and education beginning in February of 2024. Next slide, please. So in terms of the background, we wanted to give you a little bit of an update um, in terms of the work that's happened to date. So there's been a lot of work um, that has gone into developing our key components that we're uh, presenting tonight. So in terms of the work that's happened, we have done a council workshop, which was held in June. And so some of the uh, recommendations following that workshop were doing some edits related to our goals, objectives, and strategic actions. And those edits were done to enhance, to add clarity, and to make sure that we reflect internal and external environmental changes in the language that we have. In addition to this, we've done um, we've developed a vision description. So of course we have a vision as a, the city, but we wanted to add some more context and explain to the public what we really hope to achieve in those four years. And so our broader vision description that you'll see in Appendix A helps us to articulate that. We've also done some work to update our value behavior descriptions and our value behavior behavior descriptions were developed, of course, to provide examples of how we demonstrate our values in the interactions that we have with one another. In addition, uh, we held three additional council uh, focus group sessions to really look at the key components and continue to evaluate that language and do some refinements. And we're very pleased. Uh, we've had very engaged, informative sessions and some really thoughtful feedback from council that has been incorporated into Appendix A, which you received um, in conjunction with the report this evening. Next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of why we're asking for the endorsement tonight and why it's important, um, just to give you some context around what we mean by the key components. So the key components of our plan are our mission, vision, values, vision description, value behavior descriptions, and the goals, objectives, and actions. And so that's what you see contained in Appendix A. Obtaining Council's endorsement of the key components will confirm the final content and enable important implementation work to continue. So we have to have an understanding and a finalization of those elements to take us down the path towards our next deliverables. So that work will involve the development of a new strategic plan document, as well as some visual aids and a strategy on a page. It will also include, as I mentioned before, launch education and communication materials 
material that will help us support our rollout and will help us inform, enable, um, and help with that reinforcement and adoption from staff and community. And we'll also be developing a reporting framework, which will help us measure the plan and make sure that we're actually achieving what we set out to achieve. Next slide, please. So in terms of the next steps, just going back to that roadmap, we are in the process of hiring a consultant to help assist us with the development of that measurement framework. So again, that's going to help us define what does success look like with this new plan and how are we going to measure it and how are we going to report on it and be transparent with our community, with staff and with council and continuing to enhance the way that we do that. Ongoing staff engagement will continue as we develop those tools to help with the education and launch and the enablement of our plan. And we'll also be doing some significant implementation planning and a communication strategy development. I'm happy to take any questions that council has. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, any comments? Councillor Hamilton. Thank you, Mayor. They're getting through you. And thank you so much for all the work that you've done putting this together. Uh, it's an exciting plan, and we know how much thought and effort have gone, gone into it from yourself and staff. So uh, first off, thank you. Um, thank you. I guess the, the comment that I have is that there's one uh, small concern, which is in the promote and develop more transportation options section, um, there was a line that was removed from the initial draft, and that had to do with preparing for and supporting for the LRT and related development. And I know later on we left in Go Train. And so I think when we're talking about a strategic plan as the future of the city and a vision that we all want to aspire to reach, um, for me, the LRT is something that uh, is a precursor to things like the Go Train, if we're gonna include that. I think the LRT would typically come first. Uh, it ties the whole city together and something that I think we can all get excited about regardless of age, background, uh, location, in the city, it benefits everyone. Um, so what I, I was hoping to do is actually um, propose an amendment uh, to this motion, which would be to uh, to have and the council direct staff to add or return. Hey, Council, Councillor Hamilton, we need the motion on the floor before we can do amendments. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Councillor Coop, does anybody else have any comments? Any questions of staff? Okay, thank you, Jenna. Hey, okay, thank you so much. Okay, Councillor Cooper, you have the motion. Could you please put it on the floor? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor Jen. Uh, this is uh, moved by me, and hang on, I'm on the right one, right? It's moved by me, seconded by Councillor Meta, uh, the report 23 041, 2024 to 2026 strategic plan key components be received and the council endorsed the key components of the strategic plan as presented in 23-041-CRE Appendix A, draft 2024-2026 strategic plan key component content. Okay, does anybody have any questions or comments on that? This is where you want your amendment on the floor. Okay, we're gonna take a short break Well, before we do that.
So we worked on the amendment wording of an amendment that Councillor Cooper is, Councillor Cooper, Councillor Hamilton is, is uh, going to put on the floor and um, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Leggett, getting through you. Apologies for jumping the gun earlier. <laughs> Almost back at 100%, but not quite there yet. Um, but the amendment I would like to propose is that, uh, and, and that council directs staff to add preparing for the possibility of the LRT and related development. Just to have that line added, it's slightly different than the original line. But regardless of if you are in favor or not, you're preparing for the possibility. So that's it. Sure. Um, so my amendment would be along the lines of, and this might need to be wordsmithed, wordsmithed by the clerk, and that council directs staff to add um, preparing for the possibility of the LRT and related development to the promote and develop more transportation options segment of the strategic plan. Okay, any comments or questions on the amendment? Councillor Kimson. Thank you, Mayor Jan, and through you. Um, if we look under the goals and object objectives, um, which is on page 83, under prosperity, um, it notes getting around and it um, states, emphasize connectivity and active transportation choices to help people travel in and beyond the city through various modes of transportation. Doesn't that already cover potentially the LRT with that as a various mode of transportation? Um, I would say that it does, but maybe Jenna would like to speak to that. Where did Jenna go? Is that what that statement is meant to for the future potential of any different type of transportation? Yeah, through you, Mayor Liggett, that is intended to inform all types of transportation, including the possibility of the LRT. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Councillor Mehta? Well, thank you, Mayor. And through you, I'm quite comfortable with the current wording of what staff had put forward. I believe it takes into consideration all forms of transportation. And the LRT is a divisive issue in my ward. The majority are opposed to the LRT I ran in four elections, so I have a good indication of where my ward stands, and they would not want this wording added. I think um, if we're trying to appeal to all opinions, the, um, the existing wording covers it, and um, I would be opposed to changing the wording, so I'll be voting against the amendment. My constituents have made it very clear to me. Thank you. Councillor Hamilton? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I get through you. Um, and I appreciate the comments from everyone around the horseshoe. I, I really appreciate hearing your perspectives. And thank you, Councillor Kempson, for pointing out the transportation options on page 83. I think my concern with that is that getting around could mean literally anything. It could be a scooter, it could be a bike, it could be a hovercraft, for all we know. While we know the LRT is concrete, it's in front of our face. I work in Waterloo. It literally travels past my face every single day. And so I think if we're looking at the vision of the city, it's incumbent upon us to place this somewhere in the document. And I think the wording of prepare for the possibility of covers us, whether you're for it or against it, you should at least prepare for that possibility. Um, and keep in mind, we do have existing wording in this, the GO train, preparing for GO transit seems to me in some ways even more far removed, farther removed than an LRT. Um, so that wording remains. I have no issue with it because it's an aspirational vision document. So I have no problem with the GO train and I have no problem preparing for the possibility of the LRT as well. Thank you. Councillor Kimson. Thank you, Mayor Jan. Sorry, I should have asked this um, earlier. My apologies, Jenna. Um, do we have the option as we work through the sort of the development roadmap, do we have the option of adding to the document as we go along when we know a little bit more about the the route, if it's going to be the one that we're familiar with going into Galt or if it is somehow going to get changed or tweaked otherwise, is that something we could do? So through you, Mayor Liggett, can I just ask for clarification, Councillor Kimson, that you mean add, like change the wording of the description of our strategic actions? Is that what your question is referring to? 
I guess, um, wondering if it's something that for whatever reason we don't support the amendment today to specifically add the wording to prepare for the possibility, could we as a council at a later date add it into the document that we wish to you know, prepare for the LRT or advocate for the LRT or something like that? Or is it a one and done tonight sort of thing? Through you, Mayor Liggett. So I appreciate that question. I think um, in terms of what my recommendation would be, we want to try to finalize these components because, again, there are some dependencies on the wording and the language, right, in terms of how we're going to measure the plan and those kinds of pieces and in terms of the plan itself. However, that being said, one of the things that I'd like to propose going forward is that we do a comprehensive review every year to look at the environmental, do an environmental scan, look at our, our environment and what's changed. Of course, there'll be things that will come up along the way that we can't be aware of now um, that will happen that will impact our priorities. And so we can look at that, I would recommend on a yearly basis and make any required changes at that time. And so that's a common practice with uh, strategic planning that we do a comprehensive environmental scan every year and talk about any of those other changes that may need to be included. Thank you. Councillor Armetta. Well, thank you, Mayor Jan. I'm certainly um, supportive of the wording that staff have. I'm going to be leaving it at that. I also, well, another thing I like about this wording as well is if a better technology comes forward, we have the option to adjust to that. And um, I believe the LRT is an outdated technology, and I believe more and more people are finding that out. And if something better comes along, we have that option. And my constituents are strong supporters of the GO train. Most of them work in the greater Toronto area, not to the west. And they would rather have um, better GO transit along the Cambridge to Toronto corridor. And um, I am fairly confident that can be done sooner than the LRT. So I'm supporting um, the current wording, not the amendment. I'll be voting against the amendment. Thank you. Councillor Earnshaw. Thank you, Mayor Liggett. I don't know if uh, Councillor Hamilton has a seconder yet for no. his motion to amend, but I'm prepared to second it. Like Councillor Armetta, I have been talking with people in my ward, which of course is the downtown Galt Ward, Ward 4, and includes the uh, membership of the business improvement area. Uh, I also sit on that board, and as such, I'm fully aware that, that its membership is strongly in favor of the LRT. Having heard what uh, Jenna has told us about the uh, desire to finalize the document, I am concerned that it be finalized with the vague wording that may cover the LRT and not specifically address the LRT. I might add as well that some of my other constituents unlike Councillor Metas, and I recognize it's a different geographical area and therefore has a perhaps different perspective, have individually communicated with me by email to indicate their strong support for the LRT. And so I will vote in favor of the amendment uh, so that the LRT is specifically mentioned, albeit as a mere possibility, which I think protects us from, as Councillor Hamilton has stated, whether it goes one way or the other. Thank you. Okay, any more comments or questions? And you you understand that that where that goes, or do you need the clerk to put that up again? You're good? Okay, okay. Councillor Kimson. Um, can I just get the clerk to read back where it where it would go and where it would fit in specifically, if we don't mind? So the amendment falls under promote and develop more transportation op options, which is under strategic actions collaborate. In your council agenda, it's page 80, it's the bottom of page 85. You want me to read them? Would you like me to read it? Don't mind, I'm Absolutely. just um, wondering exactly where it would go in here. Okay. So under strategic actions, collaborate, promote and develop more transportation options. 
the paragraph would change to is proposed to change to uh, that staff be directed to add following this action focuses on initiatives that enhance transit systems and increase transportation options, including preparing for the possibility of the LRT and related development. That paragraph then goes on to talk about enhancing and connecting multi-use trails, investing in cycling infrastructure, improving walkability in and between the downtowns and community hubs and advocating and preparing for go transit. Councillor Kimson. Sorry, I was just saying thank you. Okay, we'll call for the vote. Starting voting on the amendment. Closing voting. And that carries with a vote of five, five to two. Okay, so now we'll vote on the main motion. And uh, who has the main motion? Councillor Cooper, you have the main motion? Could... Uh, okay. Okay, so it's, main motion uh, as we, amended. Just the main one? I don't have anything. As else. amended. I don't have that. I've got the main one here. If the clerk has it, I'm quite happy for her to read it. She's just going to draft that okay. change for you. No problem. I'm ready when you are. Could you just read the uh, um, motion uh, as amended? So just read the main motion. And it'll be as amended. It'll be recorded as amended. Yeah, I'll just read it as it is here. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is moved by me, seconded by Councillor Mehta. That report 23041 2024 to 2026 strategic plan key components be received. And the council endorsed the key components of the strategic plan as presented in 23-041 CRE Appendix A, draft 2024 to 2026 strategic plan key component content. As amended. Thank you, and I'll ask the clerk to call for the vote now. Opening voting. And closing voting. And that carries six to one. Our next report is 23-197-CD-499 Dundas Street North Official Plan Amendment and Zoning Bylaw Amendment Recommendation Report. And we have Andrea Sinclair from MHBC Planning with us to provide a presentation. Welcome. Thank you. We did provide a presentation to clerks. I'm assuming that'll be loaded. Okay, thank you. 
Okay. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council, and those members of the public here today and watching at home. My name is Andrea Sinclair. I'm a partner with MHPC Planning. I'm joined here today with representatives from Roman Homes uh, Builders, the owners of this property. Uh, we are here to talk about uh, and in support of staff's recommendation for 499 Dundas Street North. Uh, next slide, please. This was uh, matter was to a public meeting about I think almost exactly a year ago today to council. Um, we're very excited to finally be here for a decision. It was a very positive uh, meeting. The property is located on Dundas Street. It's currently been used or previously been used as a, a fast food restaurant. It's within the city's reurbanization area and along an existing transit route. Um, there are a number of services in the area that would support this type of multiple residential development. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. And uh, I'll downplay the um, fact that this is within phase two of the ION based on the last discussion, but there is existing bus transit in the area. This um, figure identifies all of the existing bus stations as well. Um, this includes the Delta I Express right at the intersection of Hespler and Dundas. So that is all transit that is already available today, including a stop that's literally adjacent to the site. Uh, if stage two of ION does go as currently proposed, um, this site would also be within a major transit station area associated with the Delta station. Next slide, please. In terms of the proposal, it's for a six-story multiple residential building with a total of 60 units. Um, we are proposing a mix of one and two bedroom units. I did want to note, um, often in these types of development, we're seeing a lot of heavy weighting towards one bedroom. In this case, we actually have more two bedrooms than one bedrooms. Um, that's in an attempt to make sure there's units available for small families or those um, with an increase of people working from home, we're thinking uh, we find there is a need for more two bedroom units in the marketplace. Uh, we have all parking is structured. There's a level of underground and then the, there's also parking um, within the ground floor of the building that's been architecturally screened from the street. We have um, bicycle parking that exceeds the current standards of the city. And just on that note, uh, when we were at the public meeting, I know there was comments from council in terms of in support of the parking reduction, whether or not more bicycle parking could be provided. So we have increased the bicycle parking um, from what we were originally proposing. So we're now exceeding the current standard, which would only be 18 indoor secure parking stalls for bikes. We now have 33. Um, we've also been able to reconfigure the parking to get more tandem spaces. While those don't count towards the zoning requirement, practically speaking for the two bedroom units, it does allow people to have two parking stalls um, that they can use. So we've also um, increased those spaces by an additional six for a total of 16 tandem spaces. Um, there is, and we'll get to additional rendering showing the rooftop amenity area and access to the parking will be from the side streets of Jarvis and Easton Street. Next slide, please. I won't go through um, this in great detail, but just to say that this proposal is fully consistent with the provincial policy statement, conforms to the growth plan. This represents intensification in the built up area and an identified intensification area within the city's official plan. Uh, next slide, please. It's within the built up area of the region's official plan and both in the region and the city's official plan, there is an emphasis on providing a significant amount of housing within the existing built up areas. Because it's a built up area, that means services, transit, all of these things are in place already and we're building upon that existing infrastructure. Next slide, please. Uh, currently, the site is designated business industrial, but as I mentioned, it's within a regeneration area within the official plan. So those are areas that, while have traditionally been used for either industrial or commercial, it, the expectation is that over the course of um, the time frame of the plan, they will transition to other uses such as higher density residential, mixed use, things like that. So uh, there is alignment with the official plan in terms of this proposal. 
The regeneration areas are permitted at a height of eight stories. We're uh, under that maximum height at a height of six stories, but do need an increase in the FSR, which is the sort of built uh, form above the site. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this just illustrates, and sorry, it's a little hard to read on the screen, but what is the current use of the property, which again has been the single story fast food restaurant and the proposed use, which we feel is a much better use of the property, especially given its location along transit as a six story multiple residential building. Um, this is going to represent infill of what is currently an underutilized property that's going to introduce greater housing options to the area. It's going to support the intensification targets of the region of the city. It's going to support existing transit and public services, provide for a mix of unit sizes, and support affordable housing initiatives through an affordable housing contribution. So uh, Council may recall a few months ago, Roman Homes uh, put forward a proposal for Liberty and Mill Street, which was approved by Council. This is the same developer for that project. They committed to an affordable housing contribution and they've committed to that uh, a same similar contribution for this project as well. So for both of their projects um, being the first projects they've done within the city and um, we're excited to continue Continue working to bring this great project to the city. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of, and I've touched on this a little bit already, improvements to the original proposal, uh, as I mentioned, we had actually a very positive public meeting, but there were some comments that we wanted to take a further look at, one being the ability to increase bicycle parking, which we have done, um, also being able to increase um, the tandems parking spaces, again, which we've done, and then there was comments about sort of amenity space and making sure that's appropriately screened from the residential neighborhood to the north. And there's some renderings in the package that shows how that's been addressed through the use of um, landscaped privacy walls for that rooftop terrace so that there's no visibility from the rooftop into the uh, abutting residential area to the north. Uh, next slide. So this image shows um, We've added an amenity building to the roof that provides more indoor amenity space for residents. Uh, it's a very tight site, so it's challenging to have really ground floor amenity, and that's why we've addressed it at the rooftop. And then you can see along this, along the north wall of the building, that um, privacy wall, it's been integrated in the planters, and that's again to focus all of the overlook of that amenity looking out over Dundas Street as opposed to looking out over the residential neighborhood to the north. Uh, next slide. Um, as part of the rooftop amenity, we're looking at things like the ability to have um, greenhouse or ability for residents to potentially grow their own food, grow their own gardens. So this is just a rendering of showing how what that might look like. Those details will be worked through the site plan process. Uh, next slide. Uh, just another rendering showing that rooftop amenity area. Uh, knowing that it is a tight site, we wanted to ensure that there was going to be high quality amenity space for the residents. So there will be a combination of both indoor and this outdoor space. Uh, next slide. I think this sort of just shows what we've already gone through, so you can move on that. Um, in terms of consideration of comments, again, I've gone through a number of these already, but just to reiterate that we have added additional bicycle parking as well as additional tandem spaces. Um, it's not noted on the slide, but I did want to let council know we're also um, going to be providing EV ready parking stalls. I know that's not a current zoning bylaw requirement, but it is the way it's going in the industry and there's more and more people driving either electric or hybrid cars. So having those EV ready stalls is something we'll be working through with the city through site plan. Um, now, policy staff through their review um, noted about potentially going higher in height if we could provide affordable housing within the building. Um, there's unfortunately so much uncertainty in the current market that we didn't know if we could have them within the project. That's why we're proposing the contribution, but there was also um, a few residents' concerns through, uh, through circulation about the height already at six stories. So wanted to respect the existing neighborhood and not be going up in even more height. Um, so in that case, we've left the height at six stories, which was the original proposal. Uh, it's also with each increase in height, if you go from six, then you're almost going to 12 because of the offset cost of going higher. So there was a number of factors to look into. 
Uh, there was also a comment from council about whether or not the building could be terraced back and have some step backs of that top floor. Again, it's something we did look at. It just didn't work with the interior layered out of the building and would have um, really had minimal um, difference in terms of shadows and things like that. But what we did do is concentrate on how we can make that rooftop amenity area more private um, and not uh, impacting the surrounding residents. And then other technical comments are really more site plan level and are being worked through with staff as, and will continue to be worked through with staff as we go through that more detailed site plan process. Uh, next slide. And that's it. I spoke quite quickly. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, thank you. We do have a line up, Councillor Kimson. Uh, thank you, Mayor Jan. And I have a couple questions if that's okay. Sure. Um, I noted um, in in the report, it's talking about the required loading spaces and that one space is required, but there's actually going to be no loading spaces. And so I'm wondering how is loading going to take place? And is that going to, how's that going to affect people dropping off, picking up, et cetera, et cetera? Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. So we can, again, it's something we'll be looking through with site plan. Um, the loading spaces requirement of the current bylaw is because the current zoning is more commercial. So you have a lot of loading of trucks coming in, things like that. For the residential development, there will be limited times when there needs to be moving trucks and things like that. But we have the ability to do that within the parking in terms of either um, temporarily having some of the visitor spots or um, pulling into the garage otherwise. So it's just, there's not a dedicated loading stall that's there, you know, all times of year for when like a commercial development would have. Um, but in terms of drop off, pick up things like that, we can have short term parking. So if someone's say having um, a delivery made, there would be ability to have those short term parking within the overall parking design. Okay, thank you. I'm just concerned about how it's such a such a busy corner and obviously it gets clogged up quite a lot. So I'm just concerned that if there's not adequate space provided for things like that, that it could really create a bottleneck. Um, my next question is, um, what is the contribution to the affordable housing fund going to be? So um, what we proposed on Liberty, what we're proposing for this one as well is a 500 per unit, which um, I understand there's been sort of a range on other projects and that seemed to be sort of consistent with some of the other projects we've been seeing within the city. Certainly, um, if, if I may be so bold as to su suggest that um, a generous contribution would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cooper. Yes, thank you, Mayor Jen. Um, thanks for your presentation. Uh, you've got uh, 60 units and 45 of them two bedroom. I just want to say hallelujah and thank you for realizing that there's actually families in this city that need more than one room and even need more than one car, which you've accommodated here. It's refreshing to see. Thank you. Um, uh, on that note, just uh, the tandem spaces. You mentioned that there's, I'm just curious about the numbers here. You've, there's a total number of tandem spaces at 16. Um, I'm just curious, is that 16 double? So there's actually 32 spaces or eight double, so 16? It, I believe it's eight doubles of 16. Eight so of there's- 16. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, no, I, I, I misspoke. It's 16 total that are tandem spaces. So 16 that won't count for the bylaw, but our existing spaces that, so there will be 16 units that could have two cars, if you look at it that way. Okay, yeah, again, thank you. I wish we could see more of that. We've got, we've actually have families in our city. So, um, wonderful, thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. Yes, thank you, Mayor Jan. Actually, um, my other, the other councillors here have already asked all my questions, um, but I just want to say thank you. I did notice in the report that you're also including 15% accessible units in the building, which is wonderful. So I love the minimum. Just, yes. Yeah. What the, at the site plan stage, what that looks like. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Earnshaw. Thank you, Mayor Liggett. And uh, through you to Andrea, uh, about these tandem spaces, um, I saw in the report somewhere, I was struggling to find it again, that they're unbundled. And I didn't know quite what that meant. Uh, could you explain that for me, please? Absolutely. And through you, Madam Mayor. Um, so the unbundled is for 
sort of the remainder of the parking spaces and unbundled really just means that if you're buying a unit, you're paying extra to get a parking space. Because if you make it that the parking is just anyone can park there, you're not gonna decrease that demand. So we wanna make it sure that if you really need a spot, you're buying a spot with your unit. And that way, the people who do not wanna pay to have a car and wanna take advantage of the bus and things like that, um, it's sort of, it's when you work through transportation demand management, that's the most effective way to reduce the demand on cars. So um, by not just having it a free for all of parking and saying, if you want the parking spot, you need to pay, you really limit. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really all it means. But with the tandem spaces, they really do have to be for the same unit because otherwise you can imagine what a nightmare that would be. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Kempson. Thank you very much, Mary Chan. I'm back again with some more questions. Um, for the two bedroom units, obviously expecting families, which is great. Um, where are the nearest parks or areas where the kids can race around and play? Um, noted that sort of it's, we're limited to the rooftop amenity area. So I'm just sort of wondering where um, people with small energetic people will be spending their time. Sure, and it might be that the context map in this presentation is probably too close of a zoom in. Um, actually, you can, you can make it out a bit. If you go back in the slide, if that's okay, to I think it's the second or third slide in the presentation, um, you do pick up, there are a number of parks that are within If you go until you get to the air photo, would be great. Yeah, this one's fine. So you can see just uh, along the Grand River, there is park associated with the school as well as um, the trails along the river. There's an additional park north of the site. And there's actually, um, and you can just make it out kind of near where the public school is by, if you follow Roxborough Road, there is a pedestrian connection over the tracks that gets to those parks to the north. So um, they are within sort of a five to an eight minute walk, some existing parks, but we did, uh, again, because they're not right on Dundas Street, wanted to make sure we were gonna have amenity on the site as well. So there are, there are existing park space, but they're not uh, obviously immediately adjacent. Um, and my second question, if I may, um, and these are proposed to be condominium units, is that correct? That is the intent, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have a question. With the rooftop terrace, you're running water lines up there, right? If we proceed with something like the greenhouses, and I think even Deb be able to have washrooms up in the amenity space, there would be, it would be service for water. If you proceed, I thought you were going to put a potential for residents to have vegetable gardens, potential greenhouse, but you were still going to do something like that. So you would need water lines up. Correct. There. Yep. And that'll be all looked at through site plan. We just haven't gotten to that level of detail in the review with planning staff for site plan, um, but I don't see why staff wouldn't be supportive of that. So we okay. would obviously have to make sure they can be watered. Okay, thank you. I have an expectation that you will be putting water lines up there. So just want that up front right now. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, there's no other questions or comments. Thank you so much. I, I have to say that um, I have seen uh, some other uh, properties that this developer has done and that's high quality. And I have... Um, I think they'll probably do a really good job here as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, so next we have uh, Jacqueline. Uh, I think you're going to come up, are you, Jacqueline, and do something? Oh.
Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council, and all in attendance tonight. I'm Jacqueline Hanneman. I'm a senior planner with the city. Um, I have been the city lead and contact for this project, working with uh, Andrea and the, uh, their team. Um, so I'll just say a few words. I think Andrea did a pretty good job at uh, going over the entire proposal. Um, and I am recommending approval for the uh, official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment at 499 Dundas Street North. Uh, next slide, please. So just as a quick reminder, the proposal is a six story, uh, 60 unit apartment building. The development is proposed within the city's built up area and within a regeneration area. The property is close proximity to commercial and community uses located on a major road um, with lots of access to public transportation. Uh, this is the type of infill redevelopment the city encourages and city's policy encourages and expects to see in this area. Next slide, please. Just a reminder that there is an official plan amendment with site specific uh, to permit an apartment building on the property with an increased floor space index. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the zoning bylaw amendment is proposed with a number of site specifics. Uh, the uh, I just wanted to mention too that there is a holding provision that is requested on this site by the region of Waterloo uh, for the completion of a record in site of site condition. This is because they are moving to a more sensitive use from what was currently there, which is uh, commercial use. So this is just a standard process that we would go through to ensure that uh, if there was any need for site remediation before the development of the site, that that would happen. So it's just sort of making sure that um, um, we can redevelop this site for residential uses. Next slide, please. Uh, planning staff is recommending approval of this development. In staff's opinion, it's an appropriate development proposal for the location in the built up area and the regeneration area with access to amenities and transit. It represents efficient use of land and has been identified by the province, region, and locally here at the city for intensification purposes. And they are located in close proximity to existing transit, existing community amenities, and represents good planning. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, questions or comments from council? Seeing none, thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Earnshaw, you have the motion. Could you please read it? Thank you, Mayor Liggett. It's moved by me and seconded by Councillor Roberts. That report 23-197-CD-499 Dundas Street North Official Plan Amendment and Zoning Bylaw Amendment Recommendation Report be received. And that Cambridge Council adopts proposed Official Plan Amendment number 62 to redesignate 499 Dundas Street North from the Business Industrial de Designation to the High Density Residential Designation with site-specific policy 8.10.97 to permit a floor space index, or FSI, of up to 3.5, and that the adopted official plan amendment be submitted to the Regional Municipality of Waterloo for approval. And that Cambridge Council approves the proposed zoning bylaw amendment to rezone the subject lands from C2, section 3.3.3, to HRM3, section 4.1.440, to facilitate the development of the lands for a six-story multiple residential development with 60 units. And that Cambridge Council is satisfied that the requirements for a public meeting in accordance with subsections 17, subsection 15, and 34, subsection 17 of the Planning Act have been met. And further, that the bylaws attached to report 23-197-CD be passed. Thank you, Councillor Earnshaw. Are there any questions? Any comments? Seeing none, I'll ask for the clerk to put the vote on the floor. Oh, Councillor Meta, slow. Well, thank you, Mayor Jan. I just wanted to say that I am gonna be voting in favor of this. I believe it checks off all the all the boxes and um, we need more missing middle housing. And I believe that this is a great example of how it can be done. And it's a great template for a lot of other developers to follow. So I'm looking forward to seeing this project come to fruition and many more. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Ahmed. I agree with you 100% on that. Now, ask clerk to put the motion on the floor. I mean, to put the vote on the floor. Starting voting. And closing voting. And that carries unanimously. Our next report is 23-312 CD, Blenheim Road, Local Improvements, Sanitary Servicing Extension Addendum. Councillor Roberts, you have the motion. Could you please read it? Yes, thank you, Mayor Jan. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Kimson. Recommendation that report 23-312 CD, Blenheim Road, Local Improvements, Sanitary Servicing Extension Addendum be received. And that report 23-274-CD Blenheim Road Local Improvement Sanitary Servicing Extension included as Appendix B be received. And that council directs staff to notify impacted property owners of the city's intention to proceed with local improvement charges option four for the extension of municipal sanitary sewer on Blenheim Road in accordance with the Ontario Regulation 586-06. And further, that the bylaw included as Appendix A to Addendum Report 23-312-CD to amend the mandatory connection bylaw be approved. And if I could just speak to this. Thank you. Um, I would just like to uh, make a direction to staff that um, if we can have the repayment terms on this extended to 20 years, possibly to make this more manageable for residents, if that's possible, I believe that would be Hardy I would be connecting with. Thank you. Thank you, Hardy. So we don't have to change anything on this? Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? Any comments? Okay, I'll ask the clerk to call for the vote. Starting voting. And closing voting. And that carries unanimously. Our next report is 23-307-CD recommendation report proposed official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment for additional residential units. And Councillor Hamilton, you have the motion. Could you please read it? Thank you, Mayor Liggett, and through you, it's moved by myself, and it is seconded by Councillor Kimson. The recommendation that report 23-307-CD, recommendation report, proposed official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment for additional residential units be received, and that Council adopts the official plan amendment, and that Council approves the proposed zoning bylaw amendment, and that Council repeals bylaws 108-18 and 22-017, and further, that the bylaws attached to report 23-307-CD be passed. Thank you. Are there any questions? Any comments? Okay, I'll ask clerk to call for the vote. Starting voting. And closing voting. And that carries unanimously. Okay, we will move on to other business. And does any member of council have any other business they wish to discuss? Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Mayor Jan. Um, in July of 2019, council approved report 19 194 CD custom traffic warning signs. That included a policy for the use of custom warning signs on city streets. The report and policy provided an outline on custom traffic warning signs and the nature of requests for such signs. In Ontario, the Ontario Traffic Manual, OTM, provides guidance on the use of traffic controls, pavement markings, and signs. Warning signs are intended to provide advance notice to drivers of unexpected and potentially dangerous conditions on or near the road. The policy approved by council only has one staff member noted as the authority to approve exceptions to custom warning signage. For continuity purposes, I would kindly request that council direct that staff update this policy to reflect that the deputy city manager or their designate be authorized to approve signage that may not meet the Ontario traffic manual guidelines provided that the criteria outlined in the policy for custom warning signs are met to the satisfaction of the deputy city manager or their designate and that no unnecessary risks are posed and this is request is to direct staff to make this update to the policy and remove the section on custom pedestrian advisory signage please thank you is 
Mr. Bromberg, are you um, comfortable with that direction? Yeah, I'm very supportive and I think this is a, um, an excellent direction for us to carry out. Okay, thank you. There you go. Okay, um, I would like to take a moment to just highlight that the week of September 18th to the 24th is Rail Safety Week in Ontario. Railway crossing and trespassing incidents continue to occur across our province. And there have been 66 fatalities and 43 avoidable serious injuries in 2022. Awareness programs like the Railway Safety Week ensure that education and public awareness is highlighted in our communities to ensure that our citizens understand the importance of safety when crossing railways. And we encourage Cambridge to please ensure pedestrians and motorists are looking and listening while near railways and obeying established uh, traffic laws. So please stay safe, Cambridge. Um, a few years back, I researched um, in the 1800s the the um, what people had died from and the uh, fatalities. Uh, the highest incidents were from rail railway um, people being killed on railways. So it doesn't seem like anything has changed. And back then they didn't even have lights and switches and that sort of thing. I, I found it extremely interesting that despite the fatalities from fire and drownings that more people died from railway accidents. Um, so we have one motion this evening, which was introduced on August 29th council meeting, but we have two pre-registered delegations for this item. Uh, members of the Family Violence Project Waterloo, Amy Hatchborn, Jennifer Hutton, Christine Taylor, and Lisa Aki. Uh, are you going to come up together or? Oh, great. Okay. Welcome. You have a presentation for slides? Yeah, we do. Okay. Just hang on one second. You will have five minutes to address council. As we're doing it together, could we request 10? We have to vote on that because we don't. Can you do it in five? I will try my best. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mayor Liggett and other honored councillors, we come before you today to request that you declare intimate partner violence an epidemic in the city of Cambridge. Slide two. We are representatives of the Family Violence Project of Waterloo Region. I'm Jennifer Hutton, CEO of Women's Crisis Services, and I have with me Amy Hackborn, Staff Sergeant of the Waterloo Regional Intimate Partner Violence Unit, Christine Taylor, Manager of the Sexual Assault Domestic Violence Treatment Center of St. Mary's Hospital, and Lisa Aki, Director of Counseling for Communal Wellbeing and Mental Health. The Family Violence Project was launched in 2006 by 12 partner members who came together in collaboration, believing that more needed to be done to address intimate partner violence in our community. The Family Violence Project was the first of its kind in Canada, and 17 years later, here we are still committed to the reduction and prevention of intimate partner violence. Slide three. We stand before you today regarding the deaths of Carol Collington, Anastasia Kuzak, and Natalie Warmingdon, who died on the September 22nd, 2015, at the hands of the same intimate partner. As you may know, an inquest into these deaths was held in June of 2022 in Pembroke, Ontario. The inquest jury heard from many experts across the province and beyond, as well as witnesses who were involved in the events leading up to and on that day. It also heard from those working in the field of intimate partner violence, such as the Waterloo Regional Police Service, and most importantly, heard from intimate partner violence survivors. The testimony provided through the inquest was tragic, powerful, and informative. The jury returned 86 significant recommendations. Next slide, please. 
We would like to paint a picture for you. The picture is a landscape that reveals the tragic history and nature of intimate partner violence in the city of Cambridge. Like every other community in Ontario and across Canada, intimate partner violence lives in the city. Each day, its harsh realities are brought to bear on its citizens. It destroys families, ruins lives and livelihoods, and causes trauma that can last a lifetime and extends beyond a generation. What does intimate partner violence look like in Cambridge? It is an important question, and we will answer it by sharing some key statistics from the last 10 years, so we all understand the magnitude of this issue in our community. From 2012 to 2022, the Waterloo Regional Police Service responded to 20,870 calls for service in Cambridge involving intimate partner violence. This is an average of over 2,080 calls per year and an average of almost six calls per day. The Waterloo Regional Police Service laid 11,020 charges involving intimate partner violence. This is an average of over 1,100 per year. 30% of all charges laid for intimate partner violence in Waterloo Region were laid in the city of Cambridge. 12 people in the city were victims of homicide, attempted homicide, and manslaughter. Serious charges for assaults, criminal harassment, strangulation, weapons offenses, and repeated breaches of court orders are laid almost daily by the Waterloo Regional Police Service. Next slide, please. And this only highlights those whose struggles come to the attention of the police. Each year, countless women and children and men seek support from various social service agencies across the region. From the agencies we have here with us tonight, we have Women's Crisis Services of Waterloo Region. And from 2022 to 2023, 284 clients in Cambridge accessed their outreach program. 115 clients stayed at their Cambridge Haven House shelter, and 90 children stayed at their Cambridge Haven House shelter. Uh, Camino Wellbeing and Mental Health, who's also uh, part of this delegation, along with the Counseling Collaborative, consistently supports more than 1,800 clients impacted by intimate partner violence each year. Since 2020, the request for counseling related to family and relationship conflict has increased dramatically. It, family and relationship conflict is a precursor to intimate partner violence and is now the third most common reason that individuals, couples, and families seek counseling and support only after anxiety and depression. It's estimated that 33% of incidents of intimate partner violence are witnessed by children and can have devastating consequences for their long-term mental health, emotional well-being, and can lead to the intergenerational cycle of violence. The Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence Treatment Centre of Waterloo Region um, is a program which responds to both St. Mary's Hospital in Kitchener and Cambridge Memorial Hospital emergency departments for cases of sexual assault, intimate partner violence and human trafficking who present to emerge. So these statistics I'm speaking of uh, represent both hospitals. So since 2023, our centre observed a marked increase in the levels of violence and injury to victims of intimate partner violence who present to both hospitals. Prior to 2020, incidents in which women were assaulted with a weapon, strangled or forcibly confined were not commonplace. But now we routinely see these cases in hospital and note a significant increase in the severity of intimate partner violence. Between 2022 and 2023, the centre responded to 107 cases of acute intimate partner violence and 234 cases of sexual violence in the emergency departments of those two hospitals. And in that same year and a half period, 140 survivors of acute intimate partner violence accessed the centre services for counselling, as did 50 victims of acute sexual violence. And the final statistic that speaks to the very nature of intimate partner violence and the challenge of combating this complex problem is that nationally, 30, between 30 and 70% of victims do not seek help 
So if even 30 more victims came forward, how significant would this issue be for the city of Cambridge? Next slide. If you could move to slide eight. The recommendation of the inquest jury was to declare intimate partner violence an epidemic. The Webster Dictionary de defines epidemic as affecting or trending to affect disproportion disproportionately large numbers of individuals within a population community or region at the same time. The statistics that were just presented would show that the Cambridge experience make it clear that this definition has been met. And as such, we are asking you to make this declaration for the community, for the victims, for their survivors, and for the future. And you're not alone in considering this matter. Landmark County Council was the first to make this declaration December 21st, 2022. And since that time, over 45 municipalities have followed suit, including the City of Ottawa, Durham Region, Burlington City Council, Peel Region, City of Toronto, City of Hamilton, and City of Kitchener. Earlier today, the Region of Waterloo Council carried the motion forward as well. It is our belief the list will only continue to grow. Next slide, please. The benefits of making this declaration by the City of Cambridge are significant. It will serve as a resounding reminder to all victims of intimate partner violence and their family that the Cambridge City Council recognizes their struggle and is here to support them. It will serve as a notice to all offenders that intimate partner violence has no place in the city of Cambridge, and that they will be held accountable for their actions. It will be a message of encouragement to all of the employees in the agencies engaged in intimate partner violence work and violence against women work across Cambridge and the region, and that their work is an integral part of the health of this community. It won't cost anything, even though its value will be immense, it will start a conversation locally that will contribute to a movement that is occurring provincially, that being a call to the Ontario provincial government to make this declaration as well. And then if I could just have the last slide, please. Intimate partner violence thrives in the shadow and in silence. So please help us bring it into the light by joining your voice with so many others as we advocate for change. Thanks so much. Thank you. You, you pulled it in off in the 10 minutes that you asked for. You you had that time. Very, very well done. Can, can we go to slide uh, five or six where you talked about the police statistics, please? I just want some clarification on something there. Um, might be before that. Yes, right there. Um, so you say in the city of Cambridge, are you saying that in the city of Cambridge, the average is 20,870 calls for service? Or are you saying 2,087 plus calls? Per, I, I don't understand that statement. So the 20,000 number is all the calls over a 10 year period from 2012 to 2022, which works out to be an average of 2,087 calls per year. For this, for this item? That's that's staggering. Yes, that's for domestic uh, intimate partner violence. Um, so it's not all, not all of those calls result in criminal charges. Some of them are verbal arguments, um, but certainly it's um, it's a call that we respond to every single day. And the um, average of charges later laid are over fifty percent. It looks like there. Could you say? Um, are some of these calls because other people may have called them in and, and do the police lay charges if the partner doesn't want to lay charges? How, how does that work? 
So the way it works in Ontario um, is if the police form reasonable grounds to believe that a criminal offence has been committed, we are obligated to lay a charge. So this takes the onus off of the victim um, because a lot of times prior to this um, being in effect for the province of Ontario, um, the police would ask, would you like a charge laid? And a lot of times the victims would say no um, because a lot of their livelihood, um, you know, their children, everything is focused around this relationship. Um, and so now the way it works is that um, the police are the ones that lay the charges. If we lay to ground, if, if we reach reasonable grounds, we don't have any discretion. We have to lay the charge. Um, the courts have different ways that they're able to resolve um, the charges, um, but but it starts out with a criminal charge if we reach grounds. Okay, I'm gonna ask for questions, so please don't sit down yet. Sure. Any questions? Councillor Roberts? Thank you, Mayor Jen. Um, thank you all so much for this presentation. Um, just to echo what Mayor Jen said, these statistics are devastating. Um, I wonder if any of you can speak to, um, you know, I've, I've often heard that the, sorry, I'm getting a little bit emotional. I feel really like attached to this situation. I've had family members affected. Oh, sorry. I didn't think I was going to. Um, can you speak to the danger for women when they're trying to leave? I've heard often that that's like the most dangerous situation. So perhaps you can speak a little bit to that. Yeah, uh, we often remind people that if they are planning to leave to make sure to get a safety plan and uh, that's why it's so important that people reach out to us at Women's Crisis Services so that they have help in a safety plan because there's so many risk factors and so many unique elements that people need to consider and to get help into in doing so because it's very much the highest risk time, absolutely. Councillor Hamilton. Thank you, Mayor. They're getting through you. And uh, thank you to Jennifer, Amy, Christine, and Lisa for sticking it out through the entire council session <laughs> to make it to the end. So I really appreciate it. And thank you for your excellent presentation, of course. Um, my question would have to do, um, it, it, it surrounds if, if you're the average Cambridge resident, this is obviously president. Uh, prevalent across our community. Uh, it's going on behind closed doors. Many people aren't aware of it. Uh, it could be happening next door. We're not quite sure. If we want to bring these numbers down, what can the average Cambridge resident do? Is it talk about it? Is it to, I mean, what, what can we do as residents to help reduce these numbers and make people safer? So we do have a program um, in place right now that started last year, uh, and it's an early intervention program. Um, and we're we're the Waterloo Regional Police Intimate Partner Violence Branch is paired up with Women's Crisis Services, and we review the um, intimate partner violence calls every single day. Um, they're reviewed a couple, by a couple different people, sometimes for content, but in this case, they're only reviewed um, to find out who the involved parties are. And if those involved parties um, have reached um, two intimate partner violence reports in a two-month span, then um, the women's crisis worker and one of our detectives will reach out to this couple. Um, these are these are ones where there haven't been um, grounds for criminal charges, and we're, we're trying to intervene before we get to that point. So they're offered supports, um, counseling, and they're also given information as to what happens if the police reach reasonable grounds. Um, and obviously the goal is to not lay charges, but to educate uh, and to prevent um, it from getting any further. Thank you. Oh. Councillor Kimson. Thank you, Mayor Jan, and for you to the oh. presenters. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to add um, another piece, which is I think just to keep the conversation going, that this isn't a private matter, that this is something that affects all of us and affects the community deeply. And the more we, we talk about it and we're willing to be open about it and say it's not okay this is not this is a, a community issue it's a fa it's not just a family private issue the more we send that message the more willing people will be to to seek help and to um, help their neighbors when they need it so thank you councillor kimson thank you mary jan um thank you for your presentation this evening and for answering all of our questions um 
you touched on it briefly during the presentation, but I'm wondering if you can speak to how this affects people of all genders and not just women, because I would expect that perhaps there may be some people who are even more hesitant to come forward um, due to due to perhaps being in a different type of um, situ situation. Um, if we can speak to that. Well, I, I would add that this is very much a gendered issue. Uh, it does disproportionately impact women, typically about 85%. Um, I know for our services, we are inclusive in regards to supporting trans, uh, gender diverse individuals. We're also talking a lot as a project as to how do we engage men, both men as allies and also men that has is struggling with abusive behavior but wants to make changes. So it's definitely part of what we're looking at, but it is very much a disproportionate issue in terms of a gender specific issue. Thank you. Councillor Cooper. Thank you, Mary. Um, yeah, thanks for what you have to say here. There's, uh, there's, there's some eye opening numbers here. Um, I'm just wondering, please tell me if I'm uh, I'm wrong here. I'm just wondering, do these these numbers have they been? Do they go up with general kind of widespread pressures that people feel? And I guess I'm referring to say the pandemic, and then since then the ensuing you know the massive cost of living, housing issues. Have you seen these numbers go up in that time? I'll take that one. So what what we do see is that um, the prevention efforts we. Uh, focus on um, aren't as effective when there's so many complexities of strains. So when you have financial challenges, when you have a housing um, challenges, when you have employment challenges, um, it's much like people are under so much strain that some of the preven preventative efforts we do, um, I'm, we're in the mild to moderate counseling business. So Porch Life, for example, in Cambridge did, mm -hmm. um, works in partnership with us. But what we see is after the pandemic, we saw a drastic increase in relationship conflict. That was the biggest increase that we saw. Of course, people are working at home together. They're um, we're we're shut, you know, we're shut down. Um, but the the old measures we use aren't as effective. We have to keep adapting our approaches and um, just really uh, pivoting to what the new need is. And and there's a lot of conflict happening. There's conflict. You know, you all, you all know this. Um, yeah, conflict happening, um, generational conflict, parent child conflict, uh, partner conflict, employment conflict, housing conflict. Like it, it's a real big focus. That's that's what we've seen. Um, and that's all precursors to uh, intimate family violence and intimate partner violence. Okay. Thank you very much. And thanks for, thanks for what you're, you're doing, what you're trying to bring attention to. Thank you. Um, I like that it's called intimate partner violence because, as we all know, sometimes it happens to men as well. Um, and uh, it's more difficult for them to prove that it's not them being the violent one and then they lose visitation rights uh, and custody of their children and having had family members who have had to go through that and then finally been able to prove that it wasn't them it was actually coming from the female i really really appreciate the fact that it says inter intimate partner violence at the same time as showing how how prevalent this is for women in our community that they're the victims of this so thank you so much for all the work that you do, as well as the ladies sitting in the audience, because I know you're part of all of this. So I appreciate everything that all of you are doing and uh, the people of this community, thank you as well. So uh, thank you. Mm. Uh, Councillor Hamilton, you have the motion. Did you wanna put it on the floor? Oh, another delegation, I'm sorry. Oh, Kim, you're gonna get up and speak. I was thanking you too soon there. Mary Leggett, members of council. I'm Kim Decker and I'm the CEO of YWCA Cambridge, an organization was providing responsive programming and services to women, girls, and gender diverse individuals in Cambridge for 75 years. I'm here to express my and YWCA Cambridge's support for Councillor Scott Hamilton's motion for, Cam for Cambridge to declare intimate partner violence an epidemic. 
Carol Culleton was 66 in 2015 before she was killed by Basil Berdutsky, Ber sorry, um, who was known to her, who scared her, and whose repeated advances re she rejected. Days after she told him once again to leave her alone and that she has a boyfriend, Basil killed her in her home. Anastasia Kuzik was 36 in 2015 when she was killed by that same man on the same day. Their relationship had ended when he was sentenced to 17 months in prison after being found guilty of physically assaulting Anastasia. Upon release, Basil was ordered to attend a partner assault response program, to which he never showed. Natalie Warmadem was 48. She lived in fear of Basil since their relationship ended three years prior. After months of abuse, including physical violence and death threats, she reported him to police and he was sentenced to 150 days in jail, but then he was released. He was ordered to attend a, a, partner, uh, a partner assault response counseling program, but once again, he never attended. Natalie was so afraid of Basil, she regularly wore a panic button that would alert police of her presence when she, was, when she pressed it, and she kept a gun beside her bed. The most striking thing about the tragedy of these deaths is how preventable they all were. Each of these women feared Basil. He was known in the community to be violent and erratic. There were countless red flags, and yet the system failed. It failed to keep these women safe, and it failed to adequately address Basil's years-long history of violence against women. Following an inquest into the Renfrew Renfru triple femicide, the jury produced 86 recommendations. Those, these recommendations point to a systemic underfunding of frontline supports and glaring gaps in the justice system. They also point to the need to reframe the public understanding of and government response to an insidious, often hidden experience, one that has far-reaching consequences. At YWCA Cambridge, we've seen firsthand the consequences of underfunding of frontline supports, including upstream prevention work. We provided free gender-based violence prevention programming with youth for more than 10 years with no core funding support. Well, the pandemic brought on a troubling increase in GBV and led to increased demand for our in-school violence prevention program. We can't secure adequate funding from any level of government or funder to begin addressing long wait lists. Meanwhile, we're hearing from school administrators and child and youth workers that violent and discriminatory behaviors among youth is only getting worse. It's well known that IPV and GBV more broadly is on the rise and that more often than not, it's men perpetuating violence against women. It's also known that IPV and GBV have significant impacts not only on the emotional and mental well-being of survivors and their families, but also on the economy. It's estimated that domestic violence costs employers in Canada $78 million annually. And a recent survey, 71% of Canadian employers reported needing to support an employee with a domestic violence situation. Beyond workplace impacts, GBV and IPV place economic strain on our health care and justice system. In 2009 alone, the economic impact of spousal violence in Canada was $7.4 billion. In contrast, achieving gender equity, of which GBV and IPV is a crucial step, has the potential to add $12 trillion to global, to global growth. To achieve a thriving economy locally, provincially, and federally, tac tackling GBV and IPV must be a priority for all levels of government. It's my hope that this council will see the importance and the urgency in joining the dozens of municipalities across the province in declaring IPV an epidemic, and that you request the province to do the same. Ending IPV and GBV requires all levels of government to first acknowledge the problem and then commit to addressing it. I worked in a shelter over 40 years ago, and I said it then and I will say it now. We need to stop thinking of IPV as a private matter and start talking about the public benefits of investing in things like violence prevention, increased frontline supports to respond to the violence, and public education. We, ha we all have a shared goal of building a thriving community. One critical way of achieving that is by tackling two of the worst impediments to women, girls, and gender diverse individuals' potential, gender-based violence and intimate partner violence. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Are there any questions from any members of council? Councillor Hamilton. Thank you, Mayor Leggett, and through you. And thank you very much, Kim, for coming and lasting the whole evening to delegate. I much appreciate it. Can you speak a little bit more about how IPV and GBV affects the YWCA, um, trends you're seeing, issues even with staff? Um, how does it affect you and your organization locally? Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, I guess a couple of things. We do um, a number of programs for women. So often we're dealing with historical trauma that women have faced years before, before coming to the work that we do. So often going back and, and finding counseling and supports for them to be able to deal with things that happened um, to them maybe 10 or 20 years ago um, when they didn't feel comfortable coming forward or going to a shelter for assistance. Um, the other thing that um, I mentioned that we do a significant amount of work on is around gender violence, gender based violence prevention with young folks. Um, so we do uh, prevention work with kids starting as young as eight years old, um, because we do believe, um, as the, the earlier delegation mentioned, that it's an important conversation that needs to happen across groups in the community, not only, not only women, but men and boys need to be a part of a conversation, as do young folks, as do gender diverse folks. So I think that's the role that we play. We see increasing violence in schools and, and are often called in to do um, some of that in school programming work. So that's where our interest lies in this issue. Thank you. Thank you for all the work you do. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Councillor Hamilton, could you put the motion on the floor, please? Mayor Leggett, and through you, it's moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Kimson. The recommendation, whereas the safety of our community and its members is of extreme importance to every single Cambridge resident, as well as to Cambridge Council, Whereas intimate partner violence, often referred to as domestic violence, means any use of physical or sexual force, actual or threatened in an intimate relationship, including emotional and or psychological abuse or harassing behavior, and persons of any gender or sex can be victims of intimate partner violence. Whereas Waterloo Region is experiencing a rise in intimate partner violence, IPV, and domestic violence during and after the COVID-19 pandemic, and the Waterloo Region Police Service, the WRPS, experiences an average of 17 calls related to IPV per day, with a total of 6,158 calls in 2022 and 66,000 calls for service in total, despite the fact that 70% of IPV incidents go unreported due to feelings of shame, fear, and secrecy. Whereas the WRPS has laid more than 35,000 charges related to IPV, or an average of 3,500 per year, Whereas in 2022, five out of the six homicides in Waterloo Region stemmed from IPV and domestic violence, with over 3,800 criminal charges issued by the WRPS in relation to IPV. Whereas between 2012 and 2022, the WRPS received a total of 20,870 calls related to IPV in Cambridge and laid a total of 11,020 charges related to IPV in Cambridge. Whereas Indigenous women are approximately 3.5 times more likely to experience some form of intimate partner violence than non-Indigenous women, and the homicide rate for Indigenous women and girls is approximately six times higher than for non-Indigenous women and girls, and Indigenous women are 12 times more likely to be murdered or missing than any other women in Canada, and 16 times more likely than white women. Whereas violence against women costs the national justice system, healthcare systems, social service agencies, and municipalities billions of dollars per year, and municipalities are on the front lines in addressing gender-based violence, be it resolved that the City of Cambridge joins over 30 other Ontario municipalities in supporting the recommendation number one from the Culleton, Kuzik, and Warmerdam inquest, the CKW inquest, informally declaring intimate partner violence, IPV, as an epidemic and that the province of Ontario be requested to declare that intimate partner violence and violence against women is an epidemic in accordance with recommendation number one of the CKW inquest, and that Cambridge recommends that Waterloo Regional Council integrates intimate partner violence into the region's community safety and well-being plan in accordance with the recommendation number 10 of the CKW inquest and set out gender-based violence and intimate partner violence as a separate priority within the plan. And further, that the city clerk be directed to send a copy of this motion to the region of Waterloo, the province of Ontario, the right honorable prime minister, members of parliament, provincial members of parliament, the United Nations, and all other Ontario municipalities. Uh, and if I may speak to the motion, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor Leggett. Um, so these are staggering numbers that we just heard. Um, the reason they came about, uh, and I want to bring this motion forward, was actually uh, conversations I had with Councillor Reed when she was in the hospital. And Councillor Reed was the original seconder of this motion. I thank Councillor Kempson for stepping up uh, after Donna's um, tragic passing. And, and the question we asked, because we seem to be talking a lot about community safety in Cambridge is, if we look to the numbers, what is the biggest community safety issue we seem to have? 
Um, and we spoke with police and we were astonished to see that uh, a lot of the the biggest safety concerns affecting Cambridge residents happen behind closed doors. And they happen in neighborhoods, they might even be happening next door to any of us. Um, so we were just shocked at the prevalence of this across our city and across the province and across the country. So why are we doing this? Because it's not our jurisdiction. We are a city council. This is something we can ask of the region and we're asking of the province. I won't go through every single reason that the delegate, delegates very eloquently expressed as to why we should lend our support to this. Um, but most importantly, I think we need to recognize that 70% of Cambridge residents that are suffering from this aren't coming forward. And we as a council need to show them that we support them, we care for them, and they're able to talk about it, they're able to seek help, and there are agencies all around them, many of them that are here tonight, where they can go to get that help. Um, we need to make sure it's public and it's safe to talk about and that people know there are places to go and they know where to go to get that help. Um, we need to band together with other municipalities to make that appeal to the province to help these agencies, to declare this an epidemic, to give them more funding because we know there's a problem on the ground and we know we need to take significant action in any way possible to address it. So even though we are a municipality, we're appealing to another level of government, I think there's strength in numbers. And this is something we certainly need uh, as much strength as possible together to combat. So I thank every single delegate that came to speak tonight and thank you all for your work throughout the community, uh, helping so many of us out there that are suffering. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Ham Hamilton. Um, I just want to comment on something. Many times elected officials are accused of doing things and with no real intent behind them, and it's considered virtue signaling. And while that may be true many times, I have to say in this instance, thank you, Councillor Hamilton, for bringing this forward. This is not virtual the signaling. This is not one of those times. This, this is a serious, serious problem that we have. And um, I'm very happy to, to be voting in support of this. Um, so uh, if nobody else has any comments, um, I'm gonna ask for a call for the vote. Starting voting. And closing voting. And that carries unanimously. Our next order of business is the motion to receive and Councillor Earnshaw, you have the motion. Thank you, Mayor Leggett. It's moved by me and seconded by Councillor Kimson that all presentations and correspondence from the September 12, 2023 council meeting be received. Thank you, Councillor Earnshaw. We'll ask the clerk to call for the vote. Starting voting. And closing voting. And that carries. Our next order of business is the consideration of bylaws. Councillor Kimson, you have the motion. Could you please read it? Thank you, Mayor Jan. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Earnshaw. Recommendation that the following bylaws listed under the heading of Introduction and Consideration of Bylaws be enacted and passed. 23-061 being a bylaw to amend bylaw 6-13 to require owners of buildings of certain classes in the municipality to connect the said buildings to the sewage service or water service of the municipality and to restrict the use of septic tanks. 23-074 being a bylaw to exempt certain lots or blocks pursuant to subsection 50 bracket 5 of the Planning Act RSO 1990 CP 13 as amended part lot control exemption blocks 119, 120, 121 and 122 on registered plan 58M696. 23-075 being a bylaw to adopt amendment number 62 of the City of Cambridge Official Plan 2012 as amended with respect to land municipally known as 499 Dundas Street North. 
23-076 being a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw 150-85 as amended with respect to land municipally known as 499 Dundas Street North, 23-077 being a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw 150-85 as amended with respect to permitting additional residential units. 23-078 being a bylaw to adopt amendment number 68 of the City of Cambridge Official Plan 2012 as amended with respect to additional residential units. Thank you, Councillor Kimson. Um, I will ask the clerk call for the vote now. Starting voting. In closing voting. And that carries unanimously. Councillor Earnshaw, you have the motion for the confirmatory bylaw. Could you please read it? Thank you, Mayor Liggett. It's moved by me and seconded by Councillor Roberts that bylaw 23-079, being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Cambridge, be passed. Thank you. I'll ask the clerk to call for the vote. Starting voting. And closing voting, and that carries unanimously. Thank you, uh, Councillor Earnshaw. You carried the heavy load of doing motions tonight. So, if you could uh, please bring forward the heaviest one of all, the motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mayor Liggett. It's moved by me and seconded by Councillor Cooper that the council meeting does now adjourn at eight thirty-nine p.m. Thank you, everyone. Oh, vote. Sorry. I'm sorry. Just <laughs> long day. <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> Help the vote. Starting voting. And closing voting. And that carries. <laughs>